This is a brief introduction to esoteric languages. It was recorded for Felina Herman's class, The Psychology of Programming, and assumes some basic knowledge from the class. However, it should still be accessible to people from the internet. As programmers, you're certainly familiar with languages like Python. You may have also seen more exotic languages like APL. You might even be familiar with graphical languages like Scratch. But here's something I'd bet you haven't seen. This is Pete, named after the famous Dutch artist. And instead of taking text as source code, it takes entire images. Pete is an example of an esoteric programming language, or esolang. There's no strict definition on what makes a language an esolang, but there are some commonalities. They are often not made for productive use, but for the purpose of artistic expression, to explore the boundaries of computing, or simply for recreation. This means there's an incredible amount of diversity in esolangs, with them often exploring ideas you won't see in a more mainstream, more useful language. In this talk, we will explore three things. Their early history, some common ways of categorizing them, and their impacts on broader computing culture. Before we start, though, a couple of quick notes. First of all, I wrote a supplementary page for this talk. There you can see more in-depth descriptions of some of these languages, as well as links to code samples so you can explore them yourself. Second is a disclaimer. I'm not actually part of the Esselang community. I've only made one Esselang in my entire life, and it wasn't a very good one. I try to do my due diligence in all my research, but I cannot guarantee that everything is 100% correct. Let's begin with some history. While there were some precursor languages, the modern Esselang culture ties itself back to 1993, when Wouter von Urtmersen, whose name I almost certainly butchered, released false. Wouter had two design goals. First of all, he wanted to make the smallest compiler he could. In the end, the compiler for false would be only one kilobyte. Second, he wanted to make the language as confusing as possible, so he made it look like this. I'm not going to try to explain how this works, I don't know. False inspired two other programmers, Chris Pressy and Urban Mueller, to create their own SLANGs. Chris Pressy went in a very different direction than False, which we'll see later, while Urban Mueller tried to take it to its extremes. Mueller realized that by making a language with just eight essential instructions, he could write a compiler that's just 240 bytes in total, small enough to fit in a tweet. Having only eight commands also made it extremely difficult to actually program in, turning even simple programs into a mind-bending puzzle. For this reason, Mueller called this language BrainFuck. The BrainFuck environment consists of a row of cells, all initialized to zero, with a program counter pointing at the first. The left and right arrows move the pointer between cells. In this case, we move the pointer forward one and back one. Plus and minus increment and decrement the current cell, meaning that plus plus would increment the current cell from zero to two. The two bracket characters form a while loop, where the only possible conditional is, is this cell zero? This loop will decrement the current cell until it's zero, at which point we end. There are also two IO commands, comma and period, that read and write to the current cell. Despite its simplicity, BrainFuck is actually Turing complete. This means that, if you really wanted to, you could write a C compiler in BrainFuck. That doesn't mean it's easy, just that it's possible. Even something like multiplying two numbers can get complicated. This program multiplies two by three. If you want to know how it works, I included an explanation at the supplementary site. Anyway, here it is in action. BrainFuck caught on very quickly. The funny name and unusual language helped a lot here, but Mueller also ran Aminet, which at the time was the largest public software repository. This gave him a very large platform, which I argue is a major reason why BrainFuck spread. Many of the people who encountered BrainFuck decided to start writing SOLINGs themselves, often starting with creating a trivial BrainFuck derivative. That's when you have the exact same syntax and semantics, but change the actual tokens, the string tokens, used to represent commands. For example, you can replace the tokens with monkey sounds, or moos, or white space. I don't think these are very interesting, but they did act as a gateway for people who wanted to start making SOLANGs. And many of the people who made trivial brainfuck derivatives would go on to make more interesting things. Each SOLANG I brought up so far was created by a single person. In fact, most are. So the goals of SOLANGs can vary as much as people do. Purely for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to introduce four reasons. The first two are recreation and comedy. We won't be talking about those. The third are what I call computationally interesting. 
These are SLNs that take a novel approach to writing algorithms and implementing behaviors. BrainFuck counts as this. The fourth category is what I call transgressive programming. These are languages that challenge our notion of what it means to write a program. In particular, I'll talk about what's called multicoding. That's when your source code is also something else. For example, with P, it is both source code and an image. I want to be clear that these aren't well-defined categories or even accurate ones. A language can belong to multiple of them, it can belong to different kinds of categories. I'm just using these because they're a useful lens for this class. So let's talk about some computationally interesting SOLangs. Computationally interesting SOLangs are still recognizable as computer programming languages, but ones that require a radically different approach to solving problems. In the case of BrainFuck, that was done by the ultra-minimalist syntax. Even something as simple as multiplication is fairly involved. I mentioned that BrainFuck was one of the two languages inspired by false. The other one was Buffunge, which came out the same year. While the overriding design principle of false and BrainFuck was to have a minimal compiler, Buffunge was designed to be as hard as possible to compile. It could be interpreted, but not compiled. It achieved this by being the first public two-dimensional language. We have a marker that starts in the upper left and moves right, executing each instruction it crosses. Once it hits the edge of the board, it wraps around back to the beginning. Some instructions do computations, pushing and popping things onto a data stack, while others redirect the marker travel. So in this example, we first push one onto the stack, then two, then four. Three is skipped entirely. Bifunge had other tricks to make compilation difficult, but this is the most famous one. It wasn't as popular as BrainFuck, but it was still very influential inside the SLang scene. Novel computation can also come from constraints. Shakespeare is an SLang where every program is designed to look like, well, a Shakespeare play. This is the first 10 lines of the Hello World. It goes on for another 75 lines. The developers needed a way to encode information without looking out of place. And the thing they eventually settled on is insults. Let's take this line by Hamlet. You are a lying, stupid, fatherless, big, smelly, half-witted coward. He's saying this to Romeo, which means that we're going to be assigning a value to the variable Romeo. Next, we count the number of adjectives. Because this insult has six adjectives, we know that the magnitude of the assignment is going to be 2 to the 6th. Finally, we categorize the final word as nice or not nice. Something like hero would be nice, while coward would be not nice. If the noun is not nice, we multiply by negative 1. So, we are going to be assigning Romeo to negative 64. This gives us a means of assigning powers of 2, and then every other number can be gotten through addition and subtraction. Shakespeare is also Turing complete, meaning that every brainfuck program can be translated into a Shakespeare program. And yes, this exists. Shakespeare actually holds a special place in my heart. When I was in college, a friend of mine wrote a Shakespeare program, and then he got a bunch of us to perform the source code as an actual play. It wasn't very good, but it did still work as a play. Shakespeare is an example of a multi-coded language. The source code is source code in one context and something else in another. We also saw this with P, which is multi-coded as a picture. Other examples include Chef, where source code is also a recipe, and Bodyfuck, where the source code is also a dance. Now, just as the Shakespeare code doesn't make a very good play, the bodyfuck code doesn't make a very good dance. For the most part, that's not the point. The point is to get us to challenge our notions of a program, not to produce art that is in of itself high quality. That said though, there are some exceptions. The inventor of Pete never intended it to produce art, and the programs he produced looked like pixel noise. But once other people started using it, they began developing their own Pete styles, creating recognizable images and eventually art. And in 2013, somebody wrote a chef program that was also a cake recipe. And then they baked the cake. And then they ate the cake. Supposedly it was quite good. Now, all of the SLANs I discussed were never designed to be used. But there are some SLANs that are designed to be useful. What makes them esoteric, though, is that they're designed for problems that are so different from mainstream problems that the entire language is bent around it. My favorite example of this is Orca. Developed by 100 Rabbits, a pair of artists who live their lives on a boat, Orca is a language designed for live coding music performances. Since it's built around an extremely specific problem, Orca has a very unusual cognitive model. Here's a quick demo. Okay, time for the live coded portion. This is Orca. It's a programming language and environment 
for live coding MIDI instruments. This is a grid of cells that we can put symbols on to both do computation and send messages. Following NetHack rules, we're this at sign, and we can move around on the board. When we press letters, we put them on the board too. If I press capital R, that is the random command. It will randomly pick some things. If I now put down here lowercase a, lowercase h, it will randomly select between the, that range of letters exclusive on h. Now I'm going to make this a lowercase r. What that does is it only has this activate on what's called a bang, essentially a signal received. Otherwise it activates every frame. Now I can send a bang either manually or by sending a signal. Every time I do this, you see that it changes the value of the random output. I can also create commands that also bang. The deed command or delay creates a bang every frame with the ability to control with inputs how often it is. I'm gonna actually copy this and move it up one. And then I'm going to put a jumper just to move the signal down one step. So now every frame, this is randomly picking a new output. Now I'm going to put a clock over here, which just cycles through outputs every frame. That's a C, like that. Then I'll put another jumper. So now we have both of these things on the same line. The reason I'm doing this is because the semicolon is the MIDI command. I mean, I'm going to put a three here. First value is going to be the channel. Second value, the octave. Third, the note. Every time a signal bangs here that activates the MIDI, it will then output this signal to whatever MIDI instrument you've configured here, like that. As you can probably imagine, we can create larger, more complicated instruments with larger, more complicated controls. And that's Orca in a nutshell. Now, you might have noticed that I didn't actually showcase music in that demo. That's because I don't have the equipment or any musical skill whatsoever. Fortunately, my friend Richard Whaling, a digital musician and the author of Systems Programming in Scala Native, is also an accomplished Orca programmer. With this permission, here is one of his pieces. So far, we've only looked at SOLangs as isolated, abstract ideas, things that are interesting but don't have broader cultural impact. So for part three of this, I'd like to turn our attention instead to how SOLangs can impact an entire community. It's a fairly niche culture, but they make a lot of SOLangs and make them for particular purposes. This is the programming subculture of code golfing and how SOLangs came to be a big part of that. Code golf is the sport of trying to write a program in as few characters as possible. For example, let's say we want to write a prime detector, where one is not prime. Here's how I'd do it in Python. First, we check that the number is not 1. Then we go through every element from 2 to num minus 1 and check to see if it's a divisor. If they're all false, we exit the loop and return true. This works, but it's also 159 bytes. How can we make it shorter? First of all, I don't actually need this conditional. I can move this all to the end. Next, why did I call it is prime? Why not just call it f? Third, I can use one space instead of four spaces for indentation. And finally, I can get rid of all the legible white space that makes this easier to read. We can do better than that. Instead of using a for loop, I can use the all function combined with a list comprehension. Now everything is on a single line which means in Python, I can use a lambda assignment, an anonymous function, to get rid of the def in return. This brings us to a total of 53 characters, exactly one-third the size of our original function. That's code golf in a nutshell. Now, I'm just an amateur at this. I got this problem from a question on the Code Golf Stack Exchange, or CGSE. The original problem also asked for us to read from input and write to output, which I left out. Golf by an expert, the Python solution does all that extra stuff and still is one byte smaller than the thing I wrote. But that's only if we use Python. Some languages are better for golfing than others. If we instead used Perl instead of Python, we could get it down to 26 bytes, less than half the size of the Python solution. And if we used APL, we can squeeze it down to 21 bytes. For a long time, Perl and APL stood at the top of the code golf hierarchy. But then people realized a problem with them. 
while they could be used as golfing languages, they weren't designed as such. They were designed to write useful programs. Now, useful programs have a lot of constraints. Things like correctness, simplicity, performance, maintainability. Golf programs, on the other hand, need to be short. If you go to CGSE, you occasionally run into a solution where the person also provides a proof that the script will get the correct answer, even if it takes longer than the lifetime of the universe. It is more important to shave a bite than make sure it runs in our lifetimes. Anyway, this inspired people to make an SOLang with the sole purpose of golfing. It was called, creatively enough, GolfScript, and it changed the golfing community forever. GolfScript is a language designed purely for golfing. This gives it a very different set of features than productive languages. For a start, the entire language is stack-based. All values are placed on a LIFO stack and popped by various operators. So like 234 plus puts three numbers onto the stack, and then it pops the top two numbers, three and four, and adds them together. You'll get 27 as the final stack. Stack-based languages have a lot less structure than conventional languages, meaning you don't waste bytes on syntax. To further condense things, each operator can do one of many things based on the types of the inputs in the stack. If it pops two numbers, the forward slash acts as division. On the other hand, if we pop an array and a number, we instead split the array into n-sized chunks. But if we pop an array and another array, we partition the second array by the value of the first. And finally, if we're popping an array and a function, then it's map. For the same problem of finding prime numbers, the golf script solution is only 14 bytes long. If you go to the supplementary site, you can see a breakdown of how it works. Four years after GolfScript comes CGSE. Being part of the Stack Exchange network, CGSE brought the golfing hobby to the masses. It was also the first golfing site that had a more form of community building in the comments, chat rooms, and meta. People would not just submit GolfScript solutions, but also explain them, which significantly grew the user base. Then people got the idea that GolfScript itself wasn't going far enough. Maybe you could make an even more compact golfing language. There are two quote-unquote obvious improvements you can make to GolfScript. The first is the use of what I call opcodes. Certain problems come up surprisingly often in code golfing, such as prime factorization. So it makes sense to put get all the prime factors into a single character. In the language Pith, that character is capital P. Then, given that the right brace is membership test and capital Q is the input, this four-character program is just is this number in its own prime factorization? Four bytes. The other significant improvement comes from expanding to arbitrary Unicode characters. GolfScript and Pith only use ASCII characters. The language Jelly, on the other hand, uses all Unicode characters, which gives it a lot more space for opcodes. Jelly assigns the capital ASH digraft to mean, is this number prime? With that, the solution is only two characters. Unsurprisingly, these languages were very controversial. Many people were already complaining that golf scripts and APLs sucked all the fun out of golfing, and super golfing languages only added fuel to the fire. Here's where something I love happens. Somebody, we don't know who, created art. In this case, the art was an SOLang called MetaGolfScript. And here's the same problem in MetaGolfScript. Zero bytes. Okay, to be fair, it's only zero bytes in this MetaGolf script. MetaGolf script is actually an infinite family of languages. Each language is identical to golf script, unless you have the empty input. In that case, we take the number of the language, convert that to a string, and then run that string as a golf script program. This means that for every programming problem, no matter what it is, there exists at least one MetaGolf script programming language that solves it in zero bytes. This is a terrible language, but a really interesting one as an artistic statement. It was also the only language that CGSE banned as a loophole. Regardless of these controversies, golfing SOLangs became embedded in the sport. But CGSE and SOLangs changed golfing in a much more fundamental way. Before, the only metric that mattered was character count. But on Stack Exchange, there are two metrics. Character count and upvotes. A brainfuck answer can easily get more upvotes than a super golfing answer due to the sheer audacity of golfing in brainfuck. This pushed people to use other, more unusual SOLangs, ones that would lead to more daring answers. For example, they used hexagony. Like Befunge, hexagony uses a 2D grid. Unlike Befunge, the grid's a hexagon. Also, there's six instruction pointers. Don't ask me how this works, I have no idea. 
SLNs are now so entrenched in CGSC culture that they not infrequently have competitions to create new ones. It's pretty clear that SLN culture had an impact on the code golf community, but the converse is also true. The code golf culture had an impact on the SLN world. One thing I elided way back in the beginning is that the vast majority of SLNs are not intended to be used. The interest is mostly in their act of creation. The Code Golf Stack Exchange was the first time a large number of people were regularly using SLANGs. One of the problems they ran into was setup. Since SLANGs are always made individually, they're often tied to the creator setup, meaning getting it running everywhere else is a chore. To fix this, Code Golf regulars created an online interpreter for esoteric languages called Triad Online. I've included a Triad Online link for every single code sample I put in this talk. It's an invaluable tool if you want to research SOLangs or just try them recreationally. As for learning resources, there are two I recommend. The first is the SOLang wiki. Running since 2006, it's a repository of over 2,500 esoteric languages. The second resource is Esoteric Codes. The curator, Daniel Temkin, does deep dives into SOLangs, talks about the broader cultural impacts, and does interviews with notable creators. It was an invaluable resource in researching this talk. And at the supplementary link, I've included links to all of the discussed languages and many of their creators' personal pages, where you can learn more about their individual work. In conclusion, I like SOLangs. Thank you for listening, and have a great day.